Instantiation is the creation of a real instance of an abstract concept. I'll use a mathematical formula to explain. x equals y times 3. This represents an abstract relationship between x and y. But if we decide that y equals 2, then we know that x equals 6. y equals 2, x equals 6 is an instantiation of the relationship x equals y times 3. We instantiate abstract models or templates or formula by replacing variables with concrete information. The Church of Women Worsting is an instantiation of a generic abstract model of how churches form and what they form into. Why, in this case, is the unquestioned belief in women worst? But it doesn't have to be. It could be an unquestioned belief in anything, including gnomism. Oh, you don't know what gnomism is? Well, it just so happens that I have an expert right here. This is Jerry. Jerry the gnome. Hi, Jerry. I see what you're doing. You're pretending gnomism is a belief system. It's not. It's a description of reality. OK, well, then could you tell us what gnomism actually is? Whenever you humans blink, us gnomes paint reality on the blank canvas of your brains. Thank you, Jerry. It's a very, very complete explanation. You don't believe in gnomism, do you? Well, I have to admit that I sort of find the relationship you're describing between gnomes and humans and reality sort of unconvincing, yeah. You see, this is why I don't talk to your kind. You hate gnomes. Well, I, I don't actually hate gnomes. My, my feelings about gnomes are, I would say, somewhat irrelevant to my opinion on the gnomist relationship between gnomes and humans. Gnomism is essential to the gnomish identity. So if I question gnomism, I hate gnomes. Yes, you are a gnomeless heathen. You know what? I got a show to do. Yeah, you do that. You hide from your bigotry. All right. Now that I've explained instantiation and introduced you to Jerry, let's take another look at the abstract model. The Church of the Unquestioned Assumption. When we have beliefs we're not allowed to question, it distorts our thinking about reality. It begins to separate us into believers and unbelievers, and once we have words for sin, we can use them to extort compliance from others. And the more it's used, these unquestioned assumptions, the more powerful they become. People who are subject to their extortion will seek to see that extortion as justice, because you don't have to live in a cage if you convince yourself it's freedom. And you start to lose power over your own mind. I'm going to read a letter I found on Kotaku in action. It's about Gamergate, and it was written by a Japanese woman alive during World War II who loves omelets. Ryan of the Stars, Grandma. She writes, Dear people of Reddit, Thank you for taking care of my great-grandson with his interests. I would like to relate a story to you. When I was young, a very, very long time ago, Japan was brilliant. There were so many new and wonderful things coming in from overseas and so many wonderful ways Japanese things were being reinvented and modernized for the modern age. My favorite was a series of books that were like recipes. They had all sorts of Chinese and Western food in them. My imagine was, imagination was set on fire thinking about what they tasted like. I remember the day a new shop opened in our town and one of the items from the books that I had always wanted to taste was on the menu. It was an omelet made of rice and vegetables. I remember thinking it was heaven to taste and so different from anything I had eaten. It was a kind of combination of Japanese food and Western food. Back then, that was a new thing. That image of succulent eggs, rice, and vegetables years later during the war saved me. Books like that were not allowed to be distributed anymore. English and Western terms had to be reimagined into horrible Japanese terms that didn't fit and their natural pronunciations were outlawed. It was there, it was there to assert the ridiculous concept that all that was around us had been created by us Japanese. 
Our family was a family of writers, and my father, whom I was very angry with at the time, but now I understand, had died saying that it is more honorable to die with the truth than live to spread lies. I could not understand why my father would not just write what they told him to write back then. I was so angry that he left us behind. I worked tirelessly every day in a factory that produced munitions for troops, and I had no choice but to comply. To this day, my hands are warped from the experience. Back then, all I understood was that all the color and vibrancy of things that had been sucked out of the world around me. I dared not think of the freer days of my childhood, because everybody told me it was a lie. I can remember it very clearly. I had trouble thinking back then. Censorship will do that to you. At first, there are such trivial thoughts that you think, surely I can bend just to this, it's only polite. You don't notice that the thoughts aren't coming as clearly as they used to, that they are being blocked by a certain mystical something you can't clearly see. Then it becomes harder to remember the facts and the principles you know are true. Things like that people from different places can cooperate, that there's not a group of white imperialists trying to oppress all of Asia, and that if we don't fight them, they will be, we will be slaves to them, and if they ever arrive on Japanese shores, then all their men will rape us. The very notion is silly. Eventually it gets so difficult to think you might give in to just stop fighting and go along with what everyone else is saying. In a corner of my mind, I would not give up. I had tasted omelette rice. I knew the idea could not come solely from Japan. I remembered the word, even though it was forbidden. That was it, the memory that proved to me what I knew was true. I had always wanted to start a restaurant of my own and have food from all over the world, healthy food that made for strong people. I don't, didn't know it back then, but I was in, what I was interested in was the burgeoning fields of nutrition that had been brought from overseas. By the time the war ended and Japan began to walk a better path again, it was too late. My opportunities were gone. I would be grateful for just a refrigerator for my growing family. Many people told me that my interest in food was simply a passing fad and that I should not be so stubborn about such a silly, small thing. But now as I look back and I see that many of my friends from that period have died, many of them have died bitterly. They never seem to recover from mind censorship. They never de seem to go back to being as vibrant thinkers as I knew them to be. They kept fitting into what they were told to fit into. I know what kept me sane was the image of omelet rice. I know that sounds silly, but it is true. Those silly brooks I was told were just children's fantasy tales and not of any real importance. But those were the last links to reality I had when everything else had been cut off. I am so glad I held on to them. People will tell you that you should not worry if silly things are censored, but censorship is a jail for the mind, and the more of it you jail, even the silly things, the less the mind can travel freely. I eventually began to recover from it because I believed in a silly thing, like my memory of how omelet rice tasted. Many old people my age will tell you that their interests like phone, that your interests like phones and games and videos are just silly, and you shouldn't get worked up about them, but I think you should. I do not like the way people act these days about what we ought and ought not to say, about words that should not be allowed, or how hobbies are bad and must be censored. It reminds me too much of my father, who drank himself to death after being forced to say too many words that were not his own. I hope the same thing never happens again for anyone in any country, but if it does, the thing that you hold on to is the silly things that you fight for, because those are the things that have an attach we have an attachment to. We hope they do not, but people do change. Your memories of lovely things will not. They will always be there to anchor your reality, and some people want to say that you're imagining things, but I assure you, you are not. A wise woman named Miya Miyuki Nakajima once said, once wrote, Fight. Those who will not fight probably laugh at the songs that who fight. Well, isn't it nice that they can laugh and you can fight? Sincerely, an old dried-up hag who loves her omelette rice. Link in the low bar to the original. Beliefs we're not allowed to question slowly distort our understanding of reality. But as they grow in power, they also differentiate into anatomical features related to maintaining and supporting that belief. Based omelette grandma's story is a testament to that, to how censorship and unquestioned beliefs, unquestioned assertions distort how we see the world. They change how we think. And that is what creates a church, a toxic church. As the toxic church gains victims and converts, an unquestioned assumption starts to grow bigger and bigger. 
and it curves a structure around it. The size and complexity of the structure will depend on many factors, such as the type of government or entity it's growing in. But the most important is the degree the unquestioned belief can extort compliance in others. Some beliefs are small potatoes. My cult leader is actually the incarnation of the Aztec god of inconveniently large staircases. As one example, as a sort of small potatoes belief, others lie at the intersection of primal motivation and powerful social forces and have quite a bit more bite, like at all times, everywhere, women need to be saved. And they're going to come and rape our women. This is a diagram of the Church of Unquestioned Assumptions. And essentially, an unquestioned assumption just starts right here. And then it just starts gathering power as more people bow their head to it and force other people to bow their heads to it. And then it starts to generate some differentiation in its cells. These ones become priests. These ones become preachers. And then the growth speeds up and you get zealots. And it just goes from there. And then it starts to differentiate. At the top are the priests and preachers. Below them in the society in the thrall of an unquestioned assertion is the government, the working class, and any number of zealots and hangers-on, which tend to actually go right here. In the new church, factions spring up around various interpretations of the unquestioned assertion. At first, the church may look like this, divided into two factions. But usually one faction wins out because they develop the one interpretation of the unquestioned assertion that turns the greatest number of people's brains off and reduces them to mindless zealots. This grants that interpretation control over the entire church structure as they direct the most violent and aggressive adherence and can accumulate the most adherence. Often the faction that wins out is also the one most willing to structure society to service its own power base, such as providing zealots financial benefits or inciting loyalty through financial dependency. Regardless, one faction wins the race to consolidate moral authority in the church of the unquestioned assumption, and then this occurs. Often the losing side will be more closely aligned with protection or provision of society, meaning it has less opportunity to pursue moral consolidation because they're too busy working and fighting. Or it may have been aligned with a former interpretation of the unquestioned assertion that fell out of favor. Regardless, it's no longer a contender in the moral dimension of the church. Moral dimension. is on top. If you look at the church from the inside, from the point of view of someone, say, here, the church looks like this. Beliefs forced on us, or that we grow up believing, can change our perception of reality, as we saw in the letter from based omelet grandma. Change it enough and we begin to regard an unquestioned assertion as an observation of reality. Thus, people within the church, these people here, may not be aware that there is a moral hierarchy at all and regard the main political division to be an economic one. An economic argument between those who want to ensure a strong economy to support the church long term and those who want to maximize immediate benefit to the church and its zealots and beneficiaries. Now let's turn back to gnomism. One of the possible instantiation of the Church of Unquestioned Assumptions. <laughs> About time! Everything she said is true when it comes to other churches, but not gnomism. Gnomism is a simple observation of reality, and you can't argue with fact. And if you do, you're a gnomisogynist. Why do you need a moral bludgeon to stop people questioning gnomism if it actually is a description of reality? Wouldn't an examination of reality confirm it? That's exactly what a gnome hater like you would say. All right, anyway. The church of, in the church of gnomism, there are two factions. The first are the gnomocrats, who believe that society should be judged by how liberated gnomes are. 
Damn straight. All that matters is the legal situation of gnomes. You humans have been oppressing us since there was a gnome to be oppressed by a human. It's about time we got ours. Who are you? I'm Joe, and I'm a gnomocrat. The second is the gnome servatives, who promote gnomely values and believe gnomes are best served by a partnership with an individual human being who will be legally and morally bound to provide for the gnome's material needs. Thus, gnome servatives practice a form of gnome-centric capitalism. That's exactly right. Gnomely values are what society needs. The gnomocratic faction believes that gnome liberty should be maximized and that gnomes should be liberated from relationships with humans. Instead of taking resources from an individual human and giving it to an individual gnome, government should take resources from humans as a class and give them to gnomes as a class. Thus, gnomocrats practice a form of gnome-centric socialism. Those damn gnomocrats can't they see that gnomes are needed to turn humans into productive members of society? How do they plan to keep the economy going without gnomes motivating humans to work in gnomely matrimony? Gnomely values served for a very long time as a way of consolidating moral, moral authority in the church of gnomism. However, unfortunately for the gnome servatives, there's been a recent two-prong attack on gnomely values gnomely values. The first was a liberation movement by a group of humans called the No Gnome Sexuals. I hate those repulsive no gnome, gnome sexuals. No gnome sexuals have a right to exist and pay taxes to support gnomes just like every other human. The No Gnome Sexual Liberation Movement permanently crippled the gnome servative ability to consolidate moral authority over all of society by using gnomely values. The second was a gnomocrat strategy, campaign strategy, called the War on Gnomes, in which the gnomocrats painted everyone else in society, except for themselves, as hating gnomes. Society hates gnomes. That's why it should put us first. In conjunction with the War on Gnomes, gnomocrats also promote campaigns such as the Don't Be That Human and Violence Against Gnomes and Human Culture is Hate Culture. They point out the statistics on rape and abuse of gnomes by humans in order to erode gnomely values as a moral rallying cry. How could you possibly want a gnome to be raped and beaten in a relationship with a human? The state has to intervene to protect and provide for gnomes. After all, the more evil humans are perceived to be, the more evil gnome servatives are for saying gnomes should have to be in a social relationship with a human in order to receive, receive his resources. I agree that humans are vile monsters, but I am only, only in a relationship with a gnome who applies the right animal training techniques will they become productive members of society. Gnomists agree, for the most part, with gnomocrats. Gnome servitists agree with gnomocrats that humans are sadistic monsters. But they also be, believe a gnomish partnership between a human and a gnome is essential to tame the savage human and make him a productive member of society, thus ensuring social stability and economic prosperity. But gnomocrats prefer to compel human service to the point of a gun. And as the mood shifts towards regarding humans as degenerate rape machines, more and more people agree gnomes agree, that the government should mediate between human and gnome. Reeling from the twin gnomocrat salvos, the no-nomosexual no, no identity and the war on gnomes, the gnomely values contingent has been knocked out of the contest for the top spot morally in gnome society and has retreated to an economic position in opposition to the gnomocrats' objective that resources be taken by the government from humans and given to gnomes. So now the gnomocrats run the church of gnomism unopposed, with the gnome servatives only able to occasionally stop them to improve the economy. Thousands of times a day we're forced to paint reality on the blank canvases of your monkey brains. You owe us. Yeah, that's true. The only question now is how are you humans going to pay us? Okay. Misunderstood. Let me take it out of the realm of the absurd. When I said that Hillary and Trump were closer together than any two candidates in history, I think many people misunderstood. Trump is socially liberal and fiscally conservative. 
One reason why the establishment Republicans hated him was that he represents a seismic shift in the conservative position. He represents the end of the family values conservative Christian platform. The family values moral standard was no doubt waning even back under George Bush Jr. with the switch to the war on terror as a rallying cry. But Trump has laid it to rest. Never again will the right be able to run a candidate under that banner. From now on, the only chance they have is to run on the platform of fiscal responsibility and government deregulation. A lot of people are hugely pleased with that, hugely pleased to the tune of one presidency. Professionally, I try to maintain pol politically neutral, but personally, I lean libertarian or anarcho-capitalist. So yes, I appreciate that the Republicans are now basically forced to become more and more libertarian. However, when I look at this in terms of strategy, this is not a win. Or at least, it's not a maintainable win. As long as the regressive left continues to consolidate moral authority under its war on women, or variations of said, they will continue to control the steering wheel of society. Because, let's be frank, what motivates people more? Kids, we gotta save our pennies for a rainy day, or they're gonna rape and murder and steal the innocence of your daughters. No contest. And with the death of family values conservatism in favor of pure economic conservatism, the left controls the moral vanguard of society without any opposition. They've also got everyone believing that servicing the economic engine of society, their economic engine, since they're the ones behind the steering wheel of society, they've got everyone believing that their moral opposition is their pit stop mechanic, the man telling them to pull over because the engine is smoking. If you think about it, that's an astounding coup. As long as we think that servicing the regressive left's engine is some sort of moral victory against the left, we have no impetus to fight any further. No impetus to reclaim this ground, which is the steering wheel of society. Once the engine is serviced, the left will continue on steering society wherever it wants to go. The reason why is simple. When people feel economically stressed, they will vote to repair the engine. But once it's repaired and they feel more comfortable, they'll look around for some new problem to solve. And the left will be there, whispering in their ear that their daughters are in danger from the boys in high school, young men's in college, their own husbands and partners. Their daughters need welfare and VAWA and Title IX and a whole new generation of government oversight to protect them from the patriarchy and also your daughter's boyfriend's cock. Have you noticed yet that socialism appears to be girl only? The Church of Women Worsting has turned from each according to his ability to each according to his need to from each according to his ability to each according to her need. And who can argue with servicing women's needs? Once the economy is recovered, we'll be right back at the beginning of another eight-year drunken economic joyride increasing government spending to the betterment of women. Betterment. The regressive left has framed servicing their engine as a victory against them. That's an incredible feat of reverse psychology. The strategy that the left has employed, it's hard not to see it as an act of genius. However, this entire situation have, may have come about completely without intention. We are a self-domesticating species, and I doubt there was any intention in our domestication. It's entirely possible that we're just seeing an equilibrium point that a complex system found on its own. Either way, until we wrest control of the steering wheel of society from the regressive left, it is their engine. The regressive left has got us all celebrating the fact that we get to fix their engine and get it rebuilt just in time for the next joy ride into oblivion. Trump's win is definitely announcing the beginning of a feast of fools, regardless of the regressive left's intention or lack thereof. And if the Church of Women Worsting pulls off a successful feast of fools, it ensures generations of power. But the church doesn't always pull it off. The Feast of Fools is a moment where everything is turned upside down, where the impossible becomes possible, where all the cards are in play, including the trump card. Sometimes during the Feast of Fools, the fools aren't mocking the pieties. They're mocking the orthodoxy. And if you have the right cards, and you play your hand very well, the house, the church, doesn't always win. But what are the right cards? Next week, I'm going to start my new series, the first of my new series. 
how the left will lose. You're a fascist! A what? You're a gnome hater and a fascist! You're just as bad as those radical gnomocrats! You're also insane! Okay, what makes you think I'm insane? Because you're arguing with yourself using a gnome, and you're losing the argument.